just, I experienced, you know, big trauma from the beginning with even my father passing away. Tell me about the trauma, the three biggest challenges in your life. My first marriage, that was the catapult for this, like the catalyst for the work that I do, abusive. I don't really believe in divorce. I, or at least at that time I didn't. I'm someone who's very loyal and um, persevere through anything and everything. And so I was in this relationship. I see it was like 11 years that we, I was in the relationship, in the marriage. I was in a relationship that I knew was not healthy. We had already talked about separation and possibly divorce and things like that. My children were taken. My children were taken from me and I had no idea. I had no idea that where they were, what was going on. He said he had a surprise for me um, that to get ready, get ready to celebrate our anniversary. I think it's our nine year anniversary. Um, said he had a surprise for me took the kids to the babysitter, and then when he came back, completely destroyed our home. Actively looking for my children. I don't know where they are, but just know I'm here to report that I'm looking for them. How I was in a toxic relationship, not only toxic, abusive, and then not only abusive, but extremely violent. And so here, this is me not knowing where my children are. You have nowhere to go and you have nowhere to turn to or so you think, at least that's, that was me. Now I'm living this life that I can't even, it, it, I never even had a reference point for. I'm able to be free in ways like expression. That I, that for me to show up here and be completely transparent that I wouldn't even have been able to do this before and to share my story. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Chief here, the professional problem solver, coming to you live for another episode of The Overcomers. We have a very interesting guest today. Her name is Lori Kinsey. Her desire is to hold a powerful, safe, energetic space to conduct emotional clearing, healing of the energetic bodies, and radical soul transformation uh, as an advanced spiral practitioner. She strives to lead from a place of integrity that enables clients to expand into their most authentic self. Her passion for this work is revealed in every session. Lori has the ability to hold a strong container because of the service work she's done in the areas of domestic violence and human trafficking. As a domestic abuse survivor, her goal is to heal on the soul level from a place of compassion and trust. Lori has a special interest in supporting conscious leaders who desire to design and create their vision. Her gift is the ability to dive deep, breaking through limiting beliefs of others while enabling high performers the ability to embody the legacy they're meant to leave in this world. She uses her transmission as a connector of souls to create her vision of bringing people together in a safe, judgment-free space because of this, Lori founded the unique online community, Red Lotus Life, where students of life from around the globe are inspired by those who share their gifts to impact the world in a positive way. The online community supports and empowers survivors of abuse to create their own tsunami of change. You can find, you can find Lori feeding her soul by loving her people heart, surrounding herself with music, exploring the magical lava fields of Utah, hiking in nature and connecting to the elements of life. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Lori Kinsey. Lori, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. What a beautiful introduction. Honestly, I don't know if I've ever heard that before. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are so aligned because I don't know if you knew, 
but my main life mission is to help God eradicate child abuse and sex trafficking from the face of the planet. So this is my my big, big vision, big mission. Everything I do in business, um, it's going to eventually connect to that mission. So we both we both are on the same journey using different tools, using different platforms and uh, experiencing our own healing and passing on the passion of healing to others. So I'm really excited about our conversation. And I wanted to start with a tradition. We have a question that kind of takes us little back. I believe there's a ripple effect in generations. So I'm curious about your grandparents and your parents. We have so many warnings and so many examples and everything that happens happens for a reason for our development for all the trauma happens so we can overcome it and become stronger it's my understanding of life but sometimes there's a pattern so share with us about your grandparents your uh, grandparents on your dad's side and your grandparents on your mom's side what do they do what kind of warnings they gave you what kind of good principles you learn from them what kind of examples and what were their professions their passions how do you remember them and then move on with uh, your parents as well mm, i love this i didn't know that about you and so <laughs> this is this is going to be a really exciting conversation because i 100 percent align with everything that you just said and i wanted to show you real fast look what i have right here oh we have the same one we do it's sitting right here I did we just become best here. friends I know that's what I'm wondering. Did this just happen? <laughs> no, I 100% believe in this as well. Um, there's definitely it's um, ancestral. It's generational. Our traumas do get passed on. It's bio energetics. Um, it's and we do. We are our grandparents, right? That's where we can look. That's the generation above us that we can actually look at the behaviors, the traits, the traumas that that our grandparents experienced full-on manifest in us that's mm -hmm. and and without us even knowing it's in our unconscious it's in our subconscious it's in our bodies our dna our genes at a cellular level it's in our bones so it's interesting that you even brought that up because i didn't think that's what we'd be talking about today but i love it so this is exactly the work that i do my grandparents on my maternal side so on my mother's side i don't really know them um my mom had a really abusive childhood and so yeah. the second that she could move us away she did and so we went as far away as possible we ended up in utah because we, she didn't have family in utah so i don't really know a lot about them um a lot of abuse um that type of thing you know she actually was not even raised by her parents she was raised by her grandparents and then when her grandparents passed away she was raised by family friends of her grandparents so that's my mother's background there um, as far as her parents go and then my grandparents on my paternal side are japanese and we're from the hawaiian islands yeah so that's a whole another thing right yeah <laughs> my grandparents were and it's an interesting story. Um, they were an arranged marriage, actually. So yeah. my great grandfather, so my grandmother's mother or father, actually owned most of Kauai. So all of the pineapple plantations and all of that. And then my grandfather's father, so my great grandfather on that side, actually was his um, most valued employee. And it was very um, uncommon for that to happen to have an employer arrange a marriage with an employee type thing yeah. and so when we're talking about my grandparents my grandmother bless her heart she was amazing in every way but she was super strict <laughs> and she actually always thought she was better than than everyone else <laughs> she thought she was this princess and then my grandfather was like this most amazing loving humble humble man in every way so very hard worker. He was a carpenter. My grandmother was a nurse um, during Pearl Harbor. 
they were part of all of that. My grandmother yeah. was a nurse in the hospital at that time. My grandfather was um, civil service. So he was actually on the beach and cleaning up the beach and helping all the soldiers and, and everything like that. So, so yeah, there's a lot that goes into that as well. <laughs> So your mom uh, never met her parents or she had a very uh, short experience with them? Very strained, strained, very strange. She never knew her father. The person that she thought was her father, it was actually at his funeral that she found out that was not her father. So her whole entire life, it was at his service. Found out that, that he was not. So she doesn't really know who her father is. Um, my grandmother, she raised her until I think she was probably 12. And then at that time, that's when she went to live with my great grandmother or my grandmother. Tell me about your parents now. So my parents now, what do you want to know? Um, like what, how your mom moved to Utah. How did she meet with your dad? So my father, they met in college. They were going to university and that's where they met. My father passed when I was about a year and a half years old mm. so he's super young totally unexpected he passed away in surgery um my mother she she lives close to me now and is living her best life but you can see um the different traumas and things that she's experienced manifesting in her health and the way that she lives her life she's an amazing beautiful woman so open-hearted but we can really see now that I know this work, I can really see how that's manifesting in her, in her health, her physical health now. Yeah. She's been through so much. Yeah. And she's never, she's not one, she's very closed off. So she's not one that's going to go and seek healing in mm -hmm. any way. <laughs> she doesn't want to talk about herself. She doesn't want to talk about the things that have happened. So people just close the door and try to not think about it but eventually it comes out once in a while and it's it hurts just with the same intensity yeah i think it's been really hard for her as i've um advanced in this work that i do because i'm very public about it kind of like when i told you i said i'm very transparent because i think it's important for people to know and it does hurt it does hurt but she's it's with her permission that I've been able to really speak publicly about what is happening with me because I'm seeing it ripple into my generation with me and then also with my children. So yeah. I'm actually seeing the ancestral <laughs> present time and now generational. Well, I, I think that our parents' generation didn't really have the tools to deal with that because my my mom is a doctor and she she was clinically depressed she was diagnosed with depression and i know based on her experience that the medication doesn't work she healed herself reading a book and just reconnecting with god and um herself and my dad has been i feel like he has been depressed all of his life but he just bottles it up and just puts it in the back shelf somewhere so they didn't have the tools to deal with that. And even now it's, it's challenging for them to open up and mm -hmm. just try to understand. So tell me about your first conscious moment when you realized your life. How old were you? What's your first memory? My first memory or when I truly felt like or knew I was alive? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because if you talk about my first memory, that's going to be probably five years old-ish. But I experienced, you know, big trauma from the beginning with even my father passing away. Were you realizing that he's gone? I don't think so. Because what I remember is actually um, my first real memory is when my mother was actually dating somebody else. So that's what I remember. And then um, if you want to talk about when I truly feel like discovered I was alive, <laughs> that was pretty recent in the last, I want to say five years. And that was when, that was when I really went deep into this healing work. And I really started to connect with my authentic self because I was so dissociated from my whole experience of life. <laughs> Because it, I actually have I've lived a pretty extreme life and I had no idea. When you live an extreme life, 
you don't realize because it's your normal. So you don't realize how extreme it actually is. But I was 100% dissociated. So your first memory is like, who's that dude? That's not my dad. Do you realize that? No, I remember having fond memories, like fond emotions. So I, I, I knew that wasn't my father, but I, it was more like my mom's friend. You know, like I could, and I don't think I ever, I don't remember ever wondering where, where's my dad or who's my dad. I don't remember that because sure, sure. I was so young. Do you remember your dad? I remember his spirit, but I, I, if it wasn't for photos. And here's another thing with my father. He was such, um, he was such an amazing man that I feel like I'm pretty lucky because people have really been able to um, share who he was with me, no matter where I went. I mean, he was a manager of a Kmart <laughs> and I can go to that Kmart now and they will recognize me and remember me and they'll tell me all these stories about my dad. And so, I mean, it really doesn't matter. Whoever knew him has really fond memories of him. So I feel like I'm pretty lucky in that way because I did like the essence of who he is. That's what I remember. What about uh, growing up in the in the teenage years? How did high school? High school was good. I was one of those people that um, I was friends with everybody <laughs> because growing up, I actually moved a lot. I I mean, it was not common. It was not uncommon for me to be in two to three different schools in one year. We moved quite a bit, and so. By the time I got to high school, I had developed that skill of always being the new kid and always being able to just talk to people. And so high school, high school was good. I don't have any complaints about high school. Remember your first law? Oh yeah, he broke my heart by writing me a note and putting it in my locker. Oh, uh, that's like the equivalent of breaking up with a text now. I well, know. It's worse though. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's regretting it now. I don't know. I don't even. Oh, yeah, I do. I'm like, what's his last name? I remember his last name. I have no idea. I haven't thought about him since probably <laughs> high school. <laughs> I'm sorry to bring it up. Okay. So tell me about the trauma, the three biggest challenges in your life. The three biggest overall? Yeah, if you have to rate them by intensity, the mm -hmm. three things, the three hardest things you had to overcome? 100% um, my first marriage, that one was, that was the catapult for this, like the catalyst for the work that I do. Um, abusive relationship, would you like me to share more about that before I go into the others or do you wanna hear the top sure. three? Give us, give us the details. Okay, so it was very interesting. I'm somebody who doesn't, I don't really believe in divorce. I, or at least at that time I didn't. I'm someone who's very loyal and um, persevered through anything and everything. And so I was in this relationship. I see it was like 11 years that we, I was in the relationship, in the marriage. And it was interesting because I didn't quite understand what was happening. And when, so whenever I want to, I want to talk about domestic violence right now. So I kind of, am I okay to share anything or yeah. Okay. So a little bit of a trigger warning, just in case there's some people out there. I want to be sensitive of that, but I was in a relationship that I knew was not healthy. We had already talked about separation and possibly divorce and things like that. Um, but he, he was wanting to work on it. He was wanting to work on it and he was wanting to, you know, go to anger management and some different things like that. And it wasn't until I, on my anniversary that, sorry, that threw me off. It wasn't until my anniversary that um, my children were taken. My children were taken from me and I had no idea. I had no idea that where they were, what was going on. He said he had a surprise for me um, that to get ready, get ready to celebrate our anniversary. I think it was our nine year anniversary. Um, said he had a surprise for me. 
took the kids to the babysitter. And then when he came back, completely destroyed our home and had ripped phones out of the wall, um, totally, you know, took all the clothes, dumped all the clothes from the dressers for my kids into garbage bags, things like that, and, and was gone. Like he destroyed the house, was gone. I had zero clue. I was totally blindsided by it. It wasn't until um, 12 days in that I realized some things that were happening there. So in Utah at the time, that's where I live, at the time there was something called an abandonment law. I'm not exactly sure the, the correct terminology of it, but basically whenever you, um, if you had possession of your children, if you had physical custody of your children and the other parents didn't, didn't have contact with them within 14 days, then DCFS would automatically award temporary custody to that parent who had physical custody. I didn't know at the time that this was what was happening. Um, I was still going to work. I, I was somebody who, like I said, I've always lived in, in extreme situations and circumstances. And so I, I kept going to work. I was in a career where, and a job that I couldn't miss work or anything. And so I just, I kept going. And then when I realized what was happening, I went, oh, okay. So I went directly to this, to this department, this organization that awards the custody. So I went there and I said, Hey, I just want to let you know that I am actively looking for my children. I don't know where they are. Um, but just know I'm here to report that I'm looking for them. And they didn't believe me at first, which is actually what happens. I think with a lot of people when they're in these situations is they're not believed. I got asked if I had called the police or if I had done anything there. And I said, no, because I grew up with this Japanese background of this is private. You don't let people see you break. And this is a family affair, things like that. You know, this is not, this is not something that, that you get other people involved in. And whenever that happened and they finally realized, no, this was really happening, they whisked me away into this counselor room where literally on a black, a whiteboard, so black and white, they drew a line down the middle and literally showed me how I was in a toxic relationship, not only toxic, abusive, and then not only abusive, but extremely violent. And so here, this is me not knowing where my children are and realizing that Oh, okay. Like there's, there was all these dots connecting at the time, but this is the type of stuff that was normal, normal in our life. So anyway, it was really, it was really, really interesting. Um, if you want to hear more, I'm happy to share more because I wasn't ready at that time. Yeah. Um, you know, that's another thing we have in common. My, my first, I was, I wasn't married, but the mother of my, of my first child, she did the same thing. Um, we took my daughter away for over a month. That was probably the hardest time in my life. So I was considering suicide at that time. Mm -hmm. So I can relate to what you went through uh, because I also, this is not embarrassment. It's just, uh, it's just pain that kind of going through the system. I, I went through the system, but it was the opposite. They told me, in Illinois, as a father, you don't have too many rights. So if the kid is with the mom, there's nothing we can do for you, sir. So that was that was really painful, and I can I can imagine what you went through. But I I had the same experience. I walked into my house, and everything was gone. <laughs> my kid, and she wasn't answering the phone for over over 35 days. Yeah. So, so yeah, if you if you wanna if you wanna share what was how did you get your kids back or what was the conclusion or how did the story continue? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you experienced that too, because it is hard. It's very it's it's almost you have nowhere to go and you have nowhere to turn to, or so you think. At least that's that was me. Um, I and also. It was embarrassment. There was some embarrassment there that this is what was happening, you know? And to be honest with you, nothing happened. Nothing happened after that because it was up to me to go and actually 
you know, they said I had to file a police report and all this stuff. So I did, I went and I got a protective order and you want to know what happened? What? He, he actually showed me how a piece of paper does not protect me. And so I, I actually went into hiding and quite a few things happened at that point because it's true. The system is not set up very well. Something actually has to happen. People have to get hurt before like a crime has to happen before anyone will get involved in no way as a mother was i going to let any of that happen so um i did i ended up dropping the protective order and just filing for divorce i mean that's kind of that's what happened actually he ended up filing for divorce he went and you know it was so interesting at that time i can't even imagine well i do know what happens because of the clients that i work with but back then, I mean, he had people following me. He was following me. He, uh, my phone was tapped, all kinds of things. And I was completely unaware of what was happening. He was always quite a few steps ahead of me. But I was, again, I was somebody who wanted to be loyal. I still loved him. I wanted it to work out. I wanted to keep our family together. And it wasn't until I started talking to an attorney. He actually retained the attorney that I wanted because he knew that I had went and talked to an attorney. But it wasn't until then that I really saw what was happening. And the time period before that moment, that moment when I finally realized, oh, this is what's happening. He had already um, take, like just cleaned out all of the accounts. And I mean, he had already started all of the process. And I, I had no idea. I thought he was going to anger management. I thought, you know, all of these things were happening. So if we fast forward, 13 years. So that happened. I finally realized, okay, I am in an abusive relationship. <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> this is not normal. This is not what, what healthy is. This is not how people parent together and co-parent together. So now 13 years later, I, the abuse continues. I think that's something that people don't understand. I think they feel as if whenever they leave a relationship, that that's the end of the abuse, but it's not. Yeah. especially if you're co-parenting. And so it was 13 years later, I actually was with somebody and they were experiencing the same thing. And so I had actually asked them if, you know, I wanted to support them. And so I said, hey, I will go with you to the domestic violence shelter. I, I have not done any of this. I'll go with you. I'll fill out all the stuff as well, you know, just to kind of support this person. And I go and I, they hand me a clipboard and on the clipboard, you know, you have to fill it out and it's checking boxes and it says, check all the boxes that have happened to you or your children in the last 48 hours. I ended up checking off every single box except um, surviving an attempted homicide. I hand it in and I was just like, holy, I can't even believe this is what's happening now. Even 13 years later, I'm remarried. Still, you know, things are going well in that way. But that's when I realized again in black and white that the abuse is still the same and actually worse. It's even more aggressive and it's still happening to me and it's happening to my children. Yeah, so they whisked me off into a counselor office and the counselor says, I've never seen anything like this before. Share it with me. What's happening with you? And I, and I was able to convince that counselor then at that time that I was okay because again, I'm calm, <laughs> I'm grounded, I'm centered, and I'm okay. I'm there's a whole waiting room full of people that need more help than I do. I'm here with my friend. I'm only here to support my friend. We're okay. She lets me go, and it wasn't until a few years, even after that, because I had to let that sink in and that to process that okay, this is still happening even after all these years, and now. And now I start this mentorship. And it was when I went into this intensive mentorship because talk therapy did not work for me. All that did was activate me. I just relived my experiences and my traumas. And then after 45 minutes, I'm, I'm activated and off by myself and going, this is not, this is not what, what's working for me right now. So I tried something else. And so I end up in this mentorship, self-development. I learn about the spiral. I go through the spiral. And I receive such huge shifts and transformations that I absolutely knew I had to become a practitioner and now do this for myself or not myself, but teach it to others. And I actually do it for myself all day, every day, but I am not 
prior to, I was living this life in complete um, fear, complete fear, not wanting to share anything about what we were doing because um, even up until a few years ago, the threat was still very much alive. And so now I'm living this life that I can't even, it, I never even had a reference point for. I'm able to be free in ways like expression that I like to, for me to show up here and be completely transparent that I wouldn't even have been able to do this before and to share my story or anything about it. There would have been so much fear and shame, even guilt around it. It's part of the healing process. Vulnerability is your superpower. <laughs> exactly. But I agree with you that uh, the abuse continues and weaponizing children is, is the worst thing a parent could do, no matter how bad the other parent is, because the child is hurting more than both parents. So I'm still still dealing with, with a lot of that. Uh, and we separated mm -hmm. over eight years ago. I'm still dealing with, with a lot of that. Yeah. And I remarried, happily married. Uh, have another child, but still have to deal with, with little battles that are just so low. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> because it's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. Um, what is what is your second biggest challenge in your life? That would be um, what happened because I wasn't in a place. Um, the relationship with my daughter, actually. So... Um, because I wasn't in a place of healing, like I, I wasn't in a healed place at all. I was 100% dissociating. So, um, when my daughter was 13, that's kind of when our relationship started. I think it's that whole mother daughter. I think we weren't that we still aren't the type that are super close. We still have our little battles and we butt heads all the time. But because of the things that were going on at that time, I mean, she ended up, it's her own story to tell, but she ended up also opening her own case with her dad, um, against her dad, actually. So there was this whole thing where she was, she didn't want to go see her dad. <laughs> all of these things were going on, um, lives being threatened, all kinds of things like that. Yeah. And then. Um, throughout the years, her teenage years, she ultimately ended up going and living with her dad at that time. And then you can imagine just the type of things that would happen because nothing, nothing changed. And so what happened for me as a mother is I started to put up those protective walls because I couldn't help. I didn't want my help. I couldn't help her. I didn't know how to help her. And so I thought by me, because it was so emotional, it was so um, violent, that there was some violence there, that, and I have another child, that I started to really distance myself as a mother. And that was the only way that I could mentally and emotionally stay sane, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, I've always... In the past eight years, I've been focusing on how to be more compassionate and how to offer grace, and and just it seems to her that I'm passive, but I'm I'm trying to be the uh, the bigger person, and and I struggle with some guilt that I didn't fight for my daughter and I didn't mm -hmm. wasn't a little bit more aggressive with uh, because there were some moments where some unacceptable moments that I was. I wanted to step in or I was supposed to step in, but I wanted her to have a relationship with her mom. Mm -hmm. And I have some regrets on that, that I could have been a little bit firmer on some things and, um, and just fight more. And instead I, I prayed and I, and I um, forgave and I just closed my eyes and offered grace and compassion. So I have similar feelings. How was your how was your custody? Did you have fifty fifty or we did do fifty fifty. Um it was an uncontested divorce because at that time there was a lot of, you know, a lot of the threats and everything happening. So he ended up retaining the attorney. I still wanted the attorney. In fact, the attorney said um he knew 
what was happening on my end. So he was saying, I can somewhat be an advocate here, you know? And so I did, I went with it and I trusted that. Um, he, you should have seen all the different versions of our divorce <laughs> because it was his decree to me. So it, it was ridiculous. A lot of ridiculous things were happening there. Like I couldn't be within a man, within I think 10 feet of a man until the kids were 18. <laughs> things like that, <laughs> like ridiculous stuff was happening. And we finally got to a version that I, I was okay with I, because honestly, I wanted to be done. There was also some safety measures that I was taking. So we did 50-50 with no um, child support, none of that stuff. I fully walked away from everything. I walked away with my couch and my car. That was it. So our home, all of that. Um, you know, it, it's interesting kind of going back to that. I think, well, I know the reason why I didn't think that I was in an abusive relationship or a violent one was because I didn't identify with the billboards that you see. I didn't identify with that. That, that wasn't my life. My life was I had a successful career. I was a mother of two children. I owned my own home. I was confident. I was married. I, you know, I was all these things and I didn't, I didn't recognize or identify with anything that, anything that um, would have said abuse, like would have used those terms, abuse or domestic violence. So when I was even going through this process, like I still didn't identify with that. I just knew I was trying to keep my, my children safe. And so when it comes to you know, circling back to this, the relationship with the children. So they got to choose where they wanted to be. And she didn't, we had rules here at our house, you know, I mean, and it's the normal rules. None of it was like super strict. It was the normal rules and she was a free spirit for sure. And so she ended up going and living with her dad. But I remember like, if I don't really live my life with regrets because I know that everything happens for a reason. It's cultivating us into the person that we are to become. But if I did have regrets, it is that hundred mm. percent. I wish I would have fought for her. I wish I would have had a better relationship with her and cultivated that so that I would know what was happening over at her dad's house because I've found out now and that's not okay. It's not okay. The things that she experienced and it's, but I didn't know how, like, I didn't know how to do any of that. Yeah. And honestly, at that time, because there was so much gaslighting and everything else that was happening, I was just trying to keep myself sane. And so by keeping myself sane, I distanced myself from my daughter, which has actually created abandonment wounds in her now. So my children are adults now. And so it's now created abandonment things with her. So when we're talking about the ancestral and generational stuff that goes on, like these are the things that happen. Her and I have a healthy relationship now, but I mean, we're constantly working on it. And it, it really is me owning that piece and me owning that I, I did the best I could, but I wasn't able, able to do, you know, to be there for her in the way that she needed me to be. I think the healing will continue and once when she has a child she's gonna it's gonna be her last phase of her healing and he's mm -hmm. she's gonna come and blame you for some stuff and as long as you own it like you do right now it's gonna be easier for her to to heal because it is generational we pass on these things and and we're product of our parents trauma and their parents and it's it's like we need to be the ones that will change it because we invested the time to heal and educate ourselves and just we need to be like the positive light that stops the darkness so I'm, I'm so glad that you're dedicating your life into helping other people that are going through this because there's such a huge amount of people that go through relationship crisis and i'm sure that I think I I was blaming my dad for a lot of things and when I had my own children it really helped me realize all right it's not that easy <laughs> and our parents had it way worse you know no tools no if you think it's hard for us to be vulnerable imagine how it was for them 
the judgment. Uh, like yeah. as a kid growing up, my biggest fear was that my parents are gonna divorce, and they were fighting a lot. And and I think somehow I might have helped to keep them together because I I kept asking them to forgive each other and to and who knows what would have happened if if they did get divorced. But that was my fear, and I and really led me to a lot of bad relationships and and just lack of commitment. So tell me about. No, I was just gonna say I'm like it's true because my I had a very, you know, they talk about this conventional family that was not us <laughs> growing up. But I didn't blame anybody for anything until I started my healing journey, and then I started going, oh wow, okay, so this is what's happening. Um, my had a father. So when I talk about my dad, if anyone knows me and I say my dad, I, I'm really talking about my stepfather because he's the one that raised me. He raised me since I was five years old. And so he was always in and out. He was always in and out of our lives. And when I say that, I mean, like, one day we'd go to school, like he was there, he was cooking his breakfast, we go to school, we come home from school, he's not there. And he's not there for months or even a year. And then um, we come home from school. He's there. He cooks us dinner. Nobody talks about it. <laughs> he's there. And then we go to school another day. And then he come home. He's gone again. I mean, I, that was what it was for um, my entire life. My mom and him were best friends. And that was the thing with her is it, constantly. I think they got married and divorced about 11 times. And even up until his death, he would, they were not together anymore. But But he was... 11 times? Yeah. <laughs> and that was my childhood. So that was normal. That was my model of a relationship, right? So whenever you're talking about that, they would fight all the time. And that was your biggest fear. I was modeled that you take, you're, you're with somebody, you're with somebody till the end and you love them until the end type thing, yeah. you know? Well, my parents are still together and now they're, um, my mom is going to turn 70 and my dad is 71. And sometimes when they still do this, uh, fights, I would be like, you guys can separate, you know, you can, you can live in this home and you can find another place and, and just, you know, just end this. And they're like, how dare you say that? This is your mother you're talking about. <laughs> they're like forever uh, stuck with each other. But, but they, it's like just their immature way of expressing love. It's, it's like, so I think it's like a flirt. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's a weird way to express love, but, uh, I, I grew up with that too, uh, that, and, and I think that's what kept me in that toxic relationship for so long, because even, even my own dad was like, what are you doing with this lady? You know, like this, you're killing yourself. And I, I've decided when I realized our relationship is bad with the mother of my first child, um, I made a decision that I'm going to sacrifice my life so we could stay together. And I said, I don't care about my happiness, but I don't want my child to have a broken family. So I stayed for three, four years too long. And that was the worst years of my life. It's just, I think it starts with our initial intention. When mm -hmm. we are immature and we underestimate uh, having a baby or getting married and just starting with the wrong intention, it's always going to lead to something terrible. Starting with the right intention, sometimes it's going to take some time, but it's going to have its its fruits and its gifts. So it's better to be patient and wait for the right person and really, really work on, on self-development and self-love and self-respect to expect that from the other person, to want to be with that person. Because I also remember having fears. What if I separate now who's gonna take me like who's gonna who's gonna do this for me who's gonna so i was afraid that i'm not gonna be able to enter another relationship and there's so many so many of these just belief systems that are wrong third biggest challenge third biggest challenge i think it's probably what i just spoke about honestly so well, that's the second one well no with my father my stepfather oh, yeah, that, like oh. that that happening um, but I never thought it was a challenge until since you asked me that question, actually, mm -hmm. because it seems like, so I, I, I just shared that with you and my mother, 
I mean, we thought we had the best childhood ever. And she never once like skipped a beat. Like it was, it was just, if he wasn't there, great. If he was great. But what I discovered since is, well, not since, but he ended up coming out as, as being gay. Um, I'm going to say, probably, I don't know. I was probably in my twenties. But, and so then it all made sense. You know, everything made sense. <laughs> my whole entire childhood made sense about when that. And I um, I fully accepted it. Not not an issue at all. Um, but whenever I, I say I think this might have been my biggest challenge was because I wasn't modeled what healthy looks like. Because again, you know, we go to the next generation up, right? She didn't know she was, she didn't have a model for that really. And it's, and you look at the generation before that same thing, you know, arranged marriages <laughs> and just, I mean, so I sit here and I think my biggest challenge actually is believing the conditioning of society on what the perfect life probably is or the perfect family, because very few of, I, I don't know, if nobody has that, you know, it's actually whenever, I guess I'm probably thinking about this because of the holidays and everything that just happened with the holidays, right? We see all of these commercials and on social media and every, everybody's like so happy and they're, they're, they're coming together for Christmas and these Hallmark Christmas movies and everything. And I sit there, I go, I've never actually had that. I've never experienced that in my entire life. Yes, we've had incredible holidays. Yes, you know, there's nothing to really, there has been traumatic ones, of course, because of domestic violence, that's usually when things happen is during the holidays, like the real, the real intense events. But that was the one thing that I really focused on with clients and people that are in my programs right now is that they're what you're seeing is not real. This is not real. It's, it's what they're selling and conditioning people to think is the Christmas spirit, but you can actually, you create your own, create your own holiday in the way that's authentic to you and in a way that lights you up and in a way that works for you and your family. And sometimes family doesn't even mean you're blood related. Sometimes family is friends and neighbors and community and things like that, service work, you know, the, like these are all the things. And so I think that's very alive for me right now because of the holidays we all just experienced and like our holidays since um, all of this has been going on with our family, we actually, you know, it's, it's pretty intense and it's pretty chaos, you know, pretty chaos, but a lot of chaos some of the time. And most of the time we don't even celebrate on the holidays because it triggers some stuff. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm really grateful now that my kids are older. So the kids are older, they're in their twenties. Now they have significant others and they have significant other families and these other families kind of go real big and they, and extravagant where with us, it's more about spending time together and cherishing those moments. So we do games and puzzles and things like that where with the other families, they actually get the big dinners and they get all the things. So they kind of, they get the best of both worlds, I feel. But when, for us, it's, it's about that true authentic connection and actually the root of why we even celebrate a holiday. And I think, I think that's what people have forgotten. And then what it does is it triggers shame, guilt, you know, sadness, loneliness, all the things. Yeah. I think, um, I agree with, with some of the things you're saying about the holidays. They definitely trigger some uh, trauma and memories. And um, that's why during Christmas and Thanksgiving and New Year's, there's a lot of people that struggle with loneliness and, and depression. It's because of that. But what, what's your relationship with God? Mm, that's a good one. <laughs> It's very, it's very close. Talk to him all day. Because so, all, so many around. I, I talk with the spiritual realm all day, every day. So the loved ones who have passed and him. And because um, our father, our biological father's job 
is to lead us to God and to father us in the way God fathers all of his children. And um, with your experience, when you were sharing about your stepdad, I was like, he, he probably had another family somewhere, but it wasn't a family, it was some, some other dude. Yep. And <laughs> yeah. So when you said that about holidays, I know that the devil is working really hard, especially now, to destroy the family. And God loves the family and had designed this brilliant model. I mean, you know how moms love their sons in a special way and fathers love their daughters in a special way. And it's like a cross because moms teach their sons what kind of wife they're supposed to find. And they teach their sons on how to respect women and, and how to value women. And fathers have the obligation to teach their daughters the same thing, how to recognize a man who would be respectful, uh, a gentleman. So um, I've really raised the bar with my daughter. We go on date nights every Friday. Can't miss that. I open the door for her. I treat her like a lady since she was three years old. So mm. uh, I pray for the guy who's going to try to win her heart. He's going to have to step up his game big time. <laughs> but I think the family is being attacked. You know, the father is being attacked. Even the mother is being attacked. The mother, the mother being a mother is such an um, important responsibility to run the household and to uh, not only be a caregiver, but an educator and support system and a person of wisdom. So I think it all starts with, with immaturity. And I recognize that in my life. The way people are dating and the way people enter relationships, you know, sex is the number one thing, sexual compatibility. It's like the physical attraction. It's lust. And uh, once when you enter a relationship because of that, because you're very attracted to that person, um, it's like eating a bucket of ice cream. And then there's a 12-course meal. There is this cold appetizers, hot appetizers, this rare appetizers then there's a soup salad and then there is one first course second course third course and then you don't really have an appetite for all this stuff if you eat a bucket of ben and jerry's you're like no I'm, i don't want to try this caviar so that's what's wrong with with society you know it's been um removing god's brilliant design because this designed for marriage and family, how to lead your family, how to be, as a father, how to be a pastor of your own family, is in the Bible. But who reads the Bible nowadays? You know, the average American reads less than one book and definitely not the Bible. I remember going to hotel rooms and every room had a Bible. That's not popular anymore. Yeah. But Taking it out everywhere. Yeah. And, and I think because with my wife that i'm married to now we did everything in the traditional godly way we followed each step and and i think it's possible to have pure joy and incredible family and it sounds a little hopeless to say that it's trivial and it doesn't exist and it's, it's a lie i think the lie is that you couldn't have a real family. You could, but you just have to do the work up front. Because if you if you uh, find someone that you're attracted to, it's you're marrying a character. You're not marrying uh, beauty. Because there's so many people you could be attracted to. Millions of people you could have fun time with. But you don't have enough time in this short life to to spend time with these millions of people. And I've, I've tried it, trust me. It, it's, very, mm-hmm. uh, it's very painful for the soul to be with multiple people in, in an intimate way. It's very painful for the soul. There's like a spiritual uncleanliness. And 
So the way it's designed is to fall in love with a character, to fall in love with someone's integrity, to say, wow, that's a good, good person to be friends with, good person to share life with. And then developing that friendship, developing, um, you know, common values together, trusting, building trust with somebody, and then eventually dating somebody, but without the dessert. Don't skip from the cold appetizer straight to the dessert. Dating somebody without sex. That's hard. Today, people will think you're a maniac. You're like, what's wrong with you? Um, and when you date somebody without sex, you're really able to see their true character. And those red flags that come around, like those moments of anger. Like I used to remember in all my relationships, I would attract toxic girls. And then it was my mission to save them. Oh, I can change her. I can give her this book to read. <laughs> I can uh, heal her. Um, so it's, it's, it's falling in love with somebody who's already a finished product and then dating for uh, necessary time to figure out belief system. What do we believe in? Ideology. What's, do, we, do you prefer capitalist world or socialist world or, or communist world? Is the world out to get you or is the world a beautiful place with people that are compassionate and love you and want to help you? Uh, then financial thermostat. Uh, parenting, um, vision for life. Are we going to live in a big town? Are we going to live in a small ranch? Are we going to live in Utah or New York City? Uh, the mission, something that you can both pray about and, and, and change the world together because it's so much more fun to change the world with your friends and, and your partner. And it's like if you pick a business partner right now, if somebody comes in, you're not just going to, Oh, that's a good-looking dude or a good-looking girl. I'll I'll give her half of my business. I'll give her to work with my clients. No, you're gonna examine everything. You're gonna run their credit. You're gonna you're gonna um, you you're gonna want to get to know them for at least a year before. And you're gonna have a specific strategy on what the partnership looks like. Who's doing what? Who's doing this? Who's doing that? And that's what people who are dating are supposed to do. Figure out. What are going to be our responsibility? How are we going to run this unit? Who? What are you going to be in charge of? Who's going to be in charge of earning money? Who's going to be in charge of doing this? Are we going to have separate finances? And that's what dating is for, just deciding how is this marriage going to look like? Because if you're dating somebody not to, for marriage, you're dating them to break their heart. And so many people I meet now, and I'm like, are you going to marry this girl? And like, well, I don't know. And you're dating her. Are you going to marry this man? Well, we'll see how it goes. Well, I already know how it's going to go if you, if you end up getting married. Um, so many relationships get to the point where uh, they're so frustrated with each other that they get married. And they think marriage is going to save their relationship. I'm like, no, that's like the biggest red flag. And, and I think when people go through these steps and eventually they get married and in an old-fashioned way, they make love for first time as a husband and wife, which probably happens in the 0.001% of the cases. Um, this is how I want to raise my children. When they do that, then that's when you love somebody's character, when you love somebody's heart, when you, when you have a vision with that somebody, a big plan, when you already develop trust, loyalty, when you, when you know that they have nothing but kindness in their heart, of course, you're going to enjoy making love to them. Mm. The performance, you know, it's not different positions. It's, it's just really enjoying every single uh, moment, every single touch. So I think that's the only way to, to have a strong family and to have a strong marriage. But there's so much information in articles and different uh, movements and different narratives that teach young girls to have certain amount of body count and and young boys and the porn being so accessible and just the abundance with these dating apps like the easiest thing is to get laid nowadays for 30 minutes and that's why there's so much 
there's so many broken families and brokenness in the world. And of course, I'm not talking about extreme religious thing. I'm not religious at all. I love God, but this is something that he designed brilliantly. And if we just follow his wisdom, we're going to have very strong my my testimony with my wife is incredible it's a miracle i don't have time to share it with you but it's a it's an absolute miracle of how i met my wife and how we developed our relationship and i i didn't ever think that i would deserve such a pure woman based on my track record and that's why i love god and i'm so thankful because we did that by his design and and I want to raise my children this way I want to protect them from from the ice cream and you can enjoy the ice cream all you want after the eight course meal but the difference is you're not going to eat the whole bucket you're going to you're going to take one scoop at a time and it will be so delicious and so satisfying so sorry to go on this but I wanted to bring some hope I didn't want to be like hopeless. No, we actually were saying pretty much the same thing really also. I feel like it goes back to connection. I love that you just shared all of that. Yeah. Because it's, easy to find, it's easy to find sexual connection with yes. so many people. Yeah. To make that the decider of marriage is dangerous. You know, and that's what I, I work with a really good friend of mine. And he keeps getting into this pattern with with girls and i'm like well do you do you want to get married or do you want to play around you until you make that decision you can't play around and expect to find the one because you're playing games and mm -hmm. it comes with a decision and it and a lot of the work we got to work on ourselves you know one of the toughest questions i teach is to ask your potential life partner, your wife or husband, what are five things, five reasons why I should marry you and three reasons why I shouldn't? And that's a very, very difficult question to answer. So, so I yeah, think I think we're on the same page. It's just, and, and I agree with you 1 million percent that just because our family is, is broken, it doesn't mean that we couldn't have family with uh, neighbors or, or or other people that we have common ground with. Family is such a broad word to me. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be blood, you know. It's it's mm -hmm. just it's caring, it's integrity, it's love. Love has no limits and mm -hmm. boundaries. It breaks all the walls. So I agree with you. What you are saying is. When you see this perfect family by the fireplace <laughs> with their ugly sweaters, if that's not the case, it doesn't mean that in in your life, it doesn't mean that that it's not possible to experience holidays. Because some people are thinking, oh, I don't have that. Well, you still have other family, family by choice. But marriage is attacked and and fatherhood is attacked and motherhood is attacked they want to send the mom to work so it's mm -hmm. it's such a privilege to be a father and to be a mother you know it really is it really and i i love that you are sharing this piece with me about you because we can come you know our experiences don't define us they cultivate us into the next version of ourselves and then the next version of our life, the next phase of our life. And so I actually, I didn't do everything that you just said, but the husband, my husband now, we celebrated 10 years together or no, 15, 15 years together <laughs> this what? year. I know I'm terrible. I'm not somebody that remembers the <laughs> anniversaries, but yeah, 15 years together. It's an amazing relationship in every way it's it's a relationship that to be honest with you because i had such toxic relationships before i didn't know i didn't know that this was the way it was supposed to be <laughs> that's a whole nother topic <laughs> sometimes when the intention is very pure 
you don't have to go through all these steps because you're willing to work it out. Mm-hmm. You're not willing to lose the person. So yeah. I think those steps are important because imagine raising children and you're like, well, I'm Jewish, you're Roman Catholic. Well, where are we going to send their school? Boom, conflict number one. Well, I'm flexible with the LGBTQ, but you're not. So what are we? What stance are we going to take as a family? And all these things could separate families. They could become, they could grow into, or imagine you want to be wealthy, but your husband doesn't. Then you're the bad person who wants to who only thinks about money, mm-hmm. or yeah. you you are socialist and capitalist and you hate rich people, but he he thinks more money will give you better freedom and you have more tools to mm-hmm. grow in every aspect of life. That could be a big deal break. Or parenting, you want to spank the kids. He thinks it's abuse. That could be a, a big big deal. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Or, I love that you're talking about it because it goes back to that emotional intelligence, right? Mm-hmm. I was really young when I got married the first time. Very young. <laughs> Early 20s. Me too. Oh, I didn't get married. I didn't get married, but it was... I've had... You know, I grew up raised by the world. Yeah. So I never had to talk with my dad. I, I learned everything from, from uh, movies and older friends. And I was exposed to porn in, at very early age. And I just, uh, I was just attracted to girls. So if you, it's like a test. If I tell you chicken, are you thinking about chicken breast or a little chick running in front of his mom? So I was thinking about chicken breast. I wasn't able to uh, to f- become a friend with a female. I was only objectifying, like looking at women as, as a sexual object and it's really dangerous because there's so many men who live their life this way so i never had a long-term relationship until i met the mother of my child so i was not experienced on how to have a relationship i was winging it and i was very young like 22 i think i was mm-hmm. and and because it started with um, physical attraction and premature sex it create it blurs your vision you don't see all the red flags you don't see the the lies and the inconsistencies and the character flaws and the trauma that they bring and you're like oh i'm sure it's gonna be all right as long as we get in bed again and it's <laughs> it's terrible and i i felt god took me through the worst relationship the most toxic one so i could find the best one how long did it take you in between? Um, so after after my toxic relationship, I was for one year I was depressed. I was not because I was sad, but I was just so broken. And and it was because she took away my child, and it was like uh, um, took me to court. And the court system is really pro mom, no matter what. And it's just it was devastating. Like. I was just starting a business and too much. I was taking care of my parents at the same time. Like it was really, really bad. And I was just depressed, defeated. Um, then I still immature. I um, started another relationship, which was like a classic rebound, just a beautiful girl. And it was uh, sexual attraction. And we were both immature we both had a lot of trauma and we were not healed and we were not helping each other in any other way but physically loving each other it was just a physical attraction and nothing that connects us in any other way and i stayed in this relationship for too long for almost two years and then one day i had an aha moment like a realization And I was like, oh, I proposed to her. I almost got married. And when I proposed, I just, I started shaking and cold sweat. It's like God was telling me, what are you doing? Like my whole body, my body was saying no. And after I proposed, I was like, hmm. We had this conversation about what are we going to do for our children? What are we going to do? And we didn't agree on a lot of things. 
And then later on, maybe a couple of weeks later, I broke it off and I was like, you know what? Even though you're very attractive, uh, I cannot marry you. And she got really mad and we, we haven't talked since then. So after that, I went on dating hundreds of girls, like on these dating apps and just exploring. Uh, you're not going to find the perfect one. Like if you go looking for a car and there's 400 cars on the lot and you look at each one of them, you're going to be so tired and confused of which one do you want, you know, and none of them would be perfect. So um, I went through this dating app period, and that was really crushing. My, my spirit was crushed. Um, I felt like a whore, like, what am I doing? And, and then I gave my life to Jesus, and I lived a life of purity for over two years. And I didn't, I didn't meet with any girls. I met with my wife. At the time, it was it was an amazing testimony. I I prayed to God to send me the woman with the bliss, the woman that will give me bliss, the woman that will deliver bliss for my life, and uh, I married a girl named Bliss. Wow, that was a miracle. You're not even messing around when you say that. The guy was like, I was like, touche. I will, I will follow your lead. And that's why I'm saying with with God everything is possible but i had to surrender i had to submit and i had to really purify myself and so yeah it was a long period i think men are immature before 35 especially if they don't have good leadership and very rarely a man that wasn't raised with good leadership by a good father i mean all fathers are good they love their kids but like a Good father is somebody who has a plan, discipline, you know. And men raised without discipline, they get beat up by life, hardcore. And around 35, they become mature and they can run a family. Before that, it's winging it. So, yeah, it took me. That goes with women, too. It took me. Well, the life expectancy is so much longer now. So we could, we don't have to start it. 18. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we got to know who we are before we start searching for significant, you know, have boundaries. I never had boundaries. My parents didn't raise me with boundaries. Just like you were saying, extreme life. That's how my life went. I wasn't, I'd never had boundaries, never protected my myself from anything. I didn't care about safety. I only care about trying to fill the hole of, of lack of love. And it's, uh, it's been an amazing journey. We have a little baby now. He's five months old. Um, and I'm going to raise him well. Raise him beautiful. in a way to respect women and to yeah. value women and to find, find the one that it's right for him. Wow. Well, just... yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting the way the world is going now, for sure, as you've talked about it, you know. Even this morning, I saw a friend of mine, he posted a thing about the AI girlfriend. It's just like, what? The dating app. You know, I never did the, the dating app. Um, I remember, you know, I'll just say this too. So I think it, this also goes for women, everything that you were saying, because being sexually compatible was in my top three. If people were to ask me, who do you want to marry? I'm like, oh, that was in my top three. It was number one, if not number, you know, number one, number two. That's so, an easy fix though, I think. I think it's an easy fix. If you respect, trust, love, if you love the character, the heart, if you know their intention, it's yeah. easy to fix. Yeah. Change a couple positions, you know, try something spicy. It's an easy fix. It but really is. It's an easy fix. And I think you're right. It's cultivating that connection again, right? Cultivating that. And so that I feel, again, if you don't have that model or if you're not teaching it, I love that you're teaching it to your children. Because if you don't have that, what what are they going to know? They're going to know what society is, is doing, right? I never did the dating apps. I was never somebody that I thought that was pure 
Yeah, it gets pure physical, right? If you're doing a dating app, it's 100% of, am I attracted to this person yeah. physically? <laughs> it's kind of like you're talking about the cars and then there's all these options and everything and who knows what you want. So I actually never did that. I was somebody that I, when I was, I just wanted that connection. I wanted that authentic connection. And yeah. so. I went on a few dates and <laughs> I've never had the experience of, wow, you look so much better in person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody puts their best most filtered picture like full body pictures are from three years ago when they used to work out yeah i've never quite understood that and but now, i love that you're even talking about this because i think that's what that is it's it's the one thing that everyone is craving right is connection and authentic connection um and i feel like it's almost a lost cause or not a lost cause a lost um skill to actually be able to connect with people in a way. So I I love that. This is one of the reasons why I love where we met in Arate is because it is all about that connection. It's about really being authentic with that and vulnerable, transparent, you know, all of these things. Because right now, just what you were talking about with God and, and Satan and everything, there is this light, right? There's this pure light. And there's also going to be this, this darkness, this other side. The darkness is actually where I usually, I'm in the undercurrents of the world quite a bit with trafficking and domestic violence and abuse survivors. So I'm over here quite a bit, which is why sometimes it can sound like I have no hope, but I do <laughs> because I, I'm living proof that there's hope. <laughs> but it's, there's going to be that polarity of this. And so I feel like, <laughs> If there's people like you out in this world doing the work that you're doing and doing this podcast and spreading the message that you are, that there's going to be more over here on this side, more of the light happening. Now, the balance is still there, but at least if our message is going out, then we're able to, going back to that part where you asked me, when did I first know I was awake? You know, I wasn't, I wasn't awake for most of my life. And so it's whenever you start to have that authentic connection to your higher self, who you are, your and your higher power, whatever that may be, that you truly do start to go, oh, this is me. This is, I'm awake. I'm awake. And now I can make a difference. And these are my skills, my gifts, my authentic gifts that are only for me to share. And it's, I don't know, it's just been an incredible experience to meet people like you in the world. So thank you for doing this work as well and for even sharing what you shared today. Yeah, I, I really enjoy your journey and your wisdom. Um, you know how Ed Milet says, you are the one in your, in your uh, family tree that's gonna stop the curse. And I really embrace that. I really live that, that I, I need to be the one that's gonna break the curse, break the chains, and everyone after me is going to say, great grandpa created those principles. My picture is going to be on the wall. I can't do that. <laughs> Looking at us. I love that. <laughs> you know, yeah, it does. It takes the one, right? It takes the one. Yeah. The cycle. It has been helping me a lot with, with just understanding life and hope and just so much. We have so much in common. So I, I, I really like the fact that we're part of this community. Uh, I recently interviewed Dr. Demartini. He's one of the doctors from the, from the Secret the documentary, The Secret. You familiar with that? Is it John? John Demartini, yeah. Oh, he, um, part of his work is actually the foundational piece of the spiral. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's an incredible guy and has mm -hmm. an awesome story. You can check out our podcast and he um really changed my perspective and many of of our viewers messaged me about that on trauma you know the question is not why is this happening to me but what good came out of this what what good came out of this yeah and and i think Something great came out of both of our toxic relationships we're in right now. We have found our purpose. We're following 
a purpose and and helping other people there's so much you were what was your career before you when you were married the first time what was it what, what i career? was in it you were in IT. imagine being in it so boring some <laughs> so boring and everyone always said that too when they'd meet me they're like like ibm techs would come in and say you're not the typical personality yeah it's so boring but it was safe it's safe yeah until indian folks come in and say i'll do it for half of the money or virtual assistant well yeah i had a close relationship to our india team <laughs> very, very incredible people very educated i yeah. respect them a lot yeah um and and they're very smart with their money i was i was watching a graph the other day of the richest people based on nationality in america and indians have just surpassed jewish people for first time in 100 years wow the average indian makes 150,000 a year that's really big numbers for average number yeah the average white american makes 56 wow. it's three yeah. times more but anyways um i wanted to talk to you about the trauma and and what good came out of each one of those challenges so starting with the first one i could assume you would say well my current marriage is something that is the exact opposite or something that's much better but i don't want to speak instead of you so what yeah. great what great came out of the abusive relationship and uh, and the uh, trauma of not seeing your children and and just uh, holding it in and what what was the great thing that came out of that well i love that you are familiar with dr martini and his work because that's all like i said that's one of the foundational pieces of the spiral is his work so it's all in the shadow right the gift is in the shadow the gift is in the experience in these experiences that we may think are lower vibrational or or darker experiences that are full of pain or pressure or whatever terminology that you want to add to that but really that's where we get the gift that's the diamond in the rough right and so now it's honestly whenever we, it's not my marriage now mm. it's, it's actually self-love it's self-love and self-worth and really knowing who i am because i couldn't have self-love and i couldn't have self-worth if i didn't know who i truly am and when i was in that first marriage there were some things that I went through that actually cultivated me to be in that marriage, right? I'm not, in fact, my ex-husband early on got a lot of the blame for everything, right? I would, I would always put things on him and that experience. But to be honest with you, there was a lot of things that actually led up to that point. And so really it's this, I didn't, I didn't know myself. I didn't know myself. I didn't love myself. And that is the true gift that I, has actually come out of that. I had to, now I am the mother. I would never abandon my children in a million years. I would never, I would fight for them. They know this. They, I, in fact, sometimes I fight for them too hard now and they want me to leave them alone because they are adults. <laughs> but I am very much a voice. I'm very much a voice in, and, and express that in every way physically mentally emotionally spiritually and energetically so you know you bring dr martini in and i can talk about all the things so it it's just i feel whole and complete in who i am which is totally 100 percent imperfect and that's that's actually the ultimate gift i feel yeah what what great came out of the of the second challenge that you've had what was the second challenge i remember the third one the third one the second yeah. oh with my daughter okay so that that again i i understand myself in a way that i never and i never i the accountability and the self-responsibility that i have with that i would have never i would have said well it's because you know because of the things that she was doing she was getting into trouble she wasn't you know, she wasn't coming home on time, whatever it was, what are all the things? I, I don't really want to share a lot of her story because it's her story yeah. to tell, but it's also an extreme one as well. And, and instead now I've a hundred percent taken accountability for that. Like, yes, the, the things would have still happened and that progression would have still happened, 
but I would have been very much involved in her life, even though she wasn't here. I'm able to hold space in a way that I, I never could before. Mm. So again, it's that emotional intelligence because at the time I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know. All I knew is I had to keep my own sanity. That's what was happening. And so unconsciously I started to create that distance where she feel, felt abandoned, you know, it was that whole thing where people say, well, sometimes you just have to cut people out of your life, you know, and I was really good at cutting people out of my life. That's actually one of my, I, it's, it is one of my gifts. It's one of my gifts when it's used in a healthy way is being able to use discernment and understand when something's not for you. But with, with her, I did that in a very unhealthy way. I was still there for her, but also not there for her yeah. at the same time. And so again, it's this, like, I understand unconditional love in a way I never have before. And I also understand how to hold space for someone else while they're going through the things that they're going through and understanding that it's not, it's not against me. I don't take offense at things. I understand people are on their own journey, but I can still be there for them and love them and support them. And have you ever uh, considered taking your mom and your daughter to a really cool road trip or maybe take them to Paris and just love on each other for two weeks? That would be a blast. <laughs> I don't know if the three of us would. I keep trying. I keep trying actually to do it. So we'll see. We've got to find something that's like common ground. <laughs> well, everyone loves Paris. I've never been. Yeah. There's other destinations. Maybe a cruise. Where yeah. gonna... actually, I've been trying to do a Christmas cruise actually for a minute. But you're right. Just having something that's just us. That would be great. Yeah. It would be very good for healing and just say some of the so you could lead kind of like the conversation in in yeah. vulnerability and and your mom could really use it and your daughter and you can use it just, mm -hmm. just to create a covenant between the three of you that yeah. you're going to live the rest of your lives in in the light that would be really or just seeing that sharing <laughs> yeah no that would be really great because my daughter is actually she's she's also in this work so she understands it and she, the mm -hmm. generational and ancestral and everything. And my mom, her mind is opening up to it because she's seen so much transformation in me. Yeah. So we actually could really talk about a lot of healing things. So that would be wonderful. And your mom can teach your daughter things that are no longer popular. And your daughter can really teach your mom things that are like right now uh, relevant. So this would be a really good connection. You could be the vessel between them. Yeah. She probably, um, who knows? I mean, I don't know, but it's good to have good relationship with grandma. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Different well, my mom, yeah, we all actually live near each other for the first time in a long time. So, mm. so yeah, this is really good. Writing it down. <laughs> so great. All right. And the third challenge what great came out of him coming out and all those years of uncertainty so what has come out of that i've always thought was a great gift actually <laughs> is that i i am able to i'm able to be the calm in the chaos actually and i'm able to hold space again i'm able to I've developed this skill where I can create connection and have acceptance for everyone, which I didn't realize that was a gift until recently. I want to say in the last couple of years, probably, but just being able to be um, vulnerable and transparent and all of that. My, my father, he was amazing. He was such an amazing man. He was very much somebody who would, be himself he would totally be himself authentically at the time i mean if you think back then it wasn't accepted like it is now but he still went and lived his life and then i can also see with my mother that unconditional love right that that acceptance again so something that i can you can i can i don't want to say blame but say i can see why i ended up in some of the situations i did and some of the relationships i did it's also like the greatest gifts that have come from that at the same time yeah so there were other things that were modeled for me in those ways so 
Yeah. If you can go back to any moment in your life, um, if you get into DeLorean and just you're able to edit this moment, you can change the circumstances, you can change your actions, you can change your words, um, or you can just observe that moment one more time. What moment would that be? In the darkest moments? Well, it doesn't have to be. <laughs> like because it's almost two different yeah. things. If, if Doc, have you seen a Back to the Future? Yeah. If Doc shows up and says, get in, but you have only one shot, what date, and if you don't remember the date, I understand, but what moment would you go back to? And then you're you're there. You can you can change what the circumstances are. You can change your actions. You can you can use your knowledge today in that moment and be wiser, more mature. Would you edit something, or you would just observe, like on a movie screen, one more time? I would I would edit, and it would be the moment that took the turn with my daughter. I would edit that. Although I don't think the outcome would be any different because I do believe everything happens in its own way and for its own purpose for the people who are involved. But I would edit um, my heart closing at that time. Mm, yeah. Well, so much sometimes is the pain and the lack of mm -hmm. support and we all have blind spots, you know. Mm -hmm. When yeah. you're lonely in that moment, it's hard. Um, most of my guests, I had a guest that actually saw his father getting murdered right in front of him. Wow. And he said, I wouldn't change it. And what if you editing that moment would lead to different circumstances today? Would they be better or worse? Um... You know what? I don't know, but I really enjoy where I am today. So I wouldn't want it to change, actually. I wouldn't want it to change. I think it's more of that is the because that was that's well, actually, maybe I wouldn't edit then because honestly, it it was taking the work to open my heart again in a very authentic way. Yeah, I think if anything, it's going to help your self love because you would yeah. be. You would see sympathy. You would feel sympathy watching yourself getting closed. And yeah. you would be like, poor Lori, you didn't know back then. You would kind of let yourself off the hook, I think. You'd be like, oh, yeah. I think so. All right. Change of state. <laughs> Tell me about your magic. What's your magic? My magic. Do you mean with what I do? Or yeah. just. Yeah, with why, being a, a spiral practitioner. Why do people hire you? What do they expect to get from you? Oh, you know, it is that complete transformation. So usually when people come to me, it's when mainstream modalities just haven't, they've tried, you know, all the things and nothing's quite working. They're totally done. They, they don't want to identify with their experiences that they've had. They are ready to shift into this state of empowerment that that is actually when people come to me and then we work together and i can't even tell you i can't even tell you the shifts that begin to happen because because we release conditioning we release conditioning and there's actually integration that goes along with that that action steps that you actually create a life you love after these experiences I have, I have an absolute passion with working with visionary leaders because I love impact. That's one of my gifts is being able to take a, a vision that you may have and bringing it to life. But, no, but you're stuck. You're in that state of fight, flight, freeze. And so if you are familiar with Dr. Martini's philosophies, it's 100% collapsing the story and regulating nervous system and creating new neural pathways, breaking old ones, creating new ones. And it's just, it's phenomenal what happens. I work with visionary leaders around the, the world that have survived um, the civil war in Lebanon or um, the things that are going on in Pakistan and just genocide, the feminine genocide and all that stuff. And it's just um, trafficking survivors that have experienced 
things that you've never even heard of before and to take to take them and to see them really connect with who they are and not who they've been told they are and also to break free from that experience and not identify with that experience anymore and now step into and embody who they truly are that's just a whole a whole different thing like the life that you think you can live is not even close to the life that you will live what is a process that you teach something that's easily implementable in our viewers our viewers right now who are craving healing um but for some reason they don't have access to you if um, if they gone through really hard emotional trauma like uh, abuse or rape or something sometimes mm-hmm. verbal abuse mm-hmm. um, or they're not able to control their thoughts and they sabotage themselves. They're in self-destructive state. Yeah. So there's a ton of things. There's actually quite a few things that you can do because when you're in that state, it can be quite overwhelming and you don't quite, it's hard to get out, right? It's slippery slope. And then we end up spiraling out. So it just depends if you're somebody that um, your nervous system is very unregulated to the point where the body is is now responding and you're having um, symptoms of panic attacks or anything like that, we can just go over that real fast. Um, I have a lot of free resources actually, so I'll go over this process real fast, but I have a lot of free resources on my website. You can actually get a downloadable and clickable PDF because, and I do this because I work with a lot of people that I want them to have this information in the moment. So, Whenever they are spiraling out, they can download it onto their phone, they can click on it, and then they can go through the processes. There's quite a few processes there, like breath work and different things. Um, And also, I have a YouTube channel, actually, it's called Red Lotus Life. And I had a, I also have a Facebook group. There's a lot of people that aren't in the Facebook group because it's not safe for them to have social media. So I moved it over into YouTube last year. But there's a lot of free resources there, a lot of techniques, workshops, all kinds of things there, because I just want people to be able to have this, these these tools. Um, I love to teach self-clearing, though we don't have time to do that right now. (laughs) I think that self-clearing should actually be taught in schools so that everybody should know it. But honestly, if you are suffering from panic attacks or you're experiencing that, really what that is, is it's the body that's starting to respond to the overwhelming emotions and unregulated nervous system. So there's a couple of things that you can do, just like with um, with an animal or a dog, I'll use the dog as an example, you can see them get into a fight and then they shake it off and then they're happy-go-lucky and they're walking down the street, right? So you can do the exact same things. If you're starting to feel overwhelmed or anxiety start to build up, you can just go, if you're at work, you can go into a bathroom stall and you just shake it out. You jump around, you shake it out, you just do all the things until you feel better. There needs to be a release, a literal physical release when you're starting to feel that build. So that's something that you can do. There's also two acupressure points that are that emotions in the body can be released from are you familiar with acupressure points by chance acupuncture acupressure like meridian points no so right here is the collarbone and so if you go um right here and you just start tapping it and rubbing it this is actually where a lot of anxiety and fear and nervousness and stuff like that is so like if you're getting ready to go talk on stage or something like that or or do a meeting or whatever it is or meet somebody or you know anything that you're just start tapping and rubbing the collarbone also the pubic bone um if you do that in the pubic bone because there's two areas it's two different kinds of anxiety you can have anxiety that's coming from fear and you can have anxiety that's coming from excitement so those are the two points, the pubic bone, you can, you can just tap on and then also the collarbone. And then there's also breath work that you can do. Have you ever heard of the, it's like box breath work. What's that? 
Wim Hof. Yes, you can do that. But if you need something that's happening in the moment, the fastest way is shaking, tapping these points, or doing the box breath. So the box breath is where you are breathing in for four counts, and then you breathe out for four counts. And you breathe in for four counts and then out for four counts. You do that for three minutes and you will regulate your nervous system. Especially if you're doing that while you're tapping either of those points. Breathing, it's so simple. And yet, so many people don't do it. Breathing techniques, we don't know how to breathe. I learned, <laughs> I learned to breathe through my nose at the age of 30. So <laughs> I know that... If you breathe through your mouth, you really trigger those fear points here. And sometimes you could be afraid of something you don't even know what. Yeah. Our previous guest um, was teaching some breathing techniques and how to release anxiety or depression through breathing. He's like really focused on living in the now. I've never seen someone so intentionally focused on that. A lot of people talk about it. But all we have is right now. So breathing helps to just be nothing. It, it, it really does. It really does. Because if you can bring yourself to the present, which is the now, and you can really start to check the boxes, am I safe? You know, like that's kind of the biggest one. Am I safe? Is this real? Is this happening right now? Most of the time, you are safe. Most of the time you can start to check off the boxes and realize you can see the stories in that whenever you are in the now. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot that can happen, and especially with breath, because when we start to get in that fight, flight, freeze, that's the first thing we don't do is breathe. And so then that actually creates <laughs> the anxiety and the overwhelm and the fear and all that. But it's at a total unconscious level because our body is literally saying, I need oxygen right now. I'm going to die. I need oxygen. And so that's why breath work is so great. That's why the box breath routine will actually like right now, it, within three minutes, especially if you're tapping those two points or either one, um, you're going to, you're going to come to a regulated state. And when you come to a regulated state, now you're, it's not that warped perception. And then here's one last thing I'll share. Um, for those that have the racing thoughts, right? So now that you're regulated, now you do a mind dump. And the mind dump is you just write it all out. Mm -hmm. Whoever's racing in your mind, you just write it all out. You don't have to be nice. You don't have, so if you're angry or anything like that, write everything out because your thoughts become emotions. And then your emotions become the energy that moves in your body. And that's why your body starts to react. So it's this whole trigger effect that happens and when you write it down sometimes you can recognize it's a lie easier oh yeah right away usually yeah especially if you're with somebody maybe with a patient and you make them write it down and then you make them read it they're like i can't read that because it's not true <laughs> yeah it's true <laughs> with dealing with depression we become delusional sometimes and somebody else needs to ask and challenge the depressed person, is this true? It's that mm -hmm. easy. What mm -hmm. you're saying, how is it a fact or is it just in your mind? So that's what this previous guest says. So he believes that the past doesn't exist. It's like a fantasy that we can't recreate. It's just, it's gone. We can't go back to it. Yeah. The future doesn't exist. Yep. So what's the point of, of being anxious or depressed? And it sounds like a simple concept, but most people, most people suffer with one or the other. What is one thing that you're focused on right now in your self-development journey or healing journey, maybe a distraction or addiction or something that you want to improve on in your personal life? You know, um, for me in my personal life, I feel like it's balance, which is funny because there's no such thing as balance. <laughs> and that's the thing with Arte. I, I love it because I'm hungry for, like, I've always loved what I do. And now that I have a passion for what I do, that's, that's totally, it just fuels it. And it never feels like work. But now 
you know, I want, I want this nourishing life in every single area of my life. And so really with this new year, that's what I'm focused on is I'm focused on really kind of pulling in some places that are out of balance and then focusing on nourishing and cultivating the other pieces of my life. So, so that's, that's been really good. I mean, we're only a few days in, so yeah, it's been good because the gyms are still packed. I was there last night, a lot of kids, which is a good sign. Yeah, that is a good sign. I mean, moving our body is so healthy. Be being healthy is just amazing for your mental health. So like moving your body, because that also moves the energy and the emotions. In fact, that's another thing. If you are somebody that um, is really spinning out, go move your body. Moving your body will bring you back to center real fast so that you can think logically. So there's that. And then when we eat healthy, I mean, our mental health is 100% in our gut. Have you done 75 hard? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm determined this year to get into the best shape in my life. And I'm doing the whole year, like the 75 hard, live hard, the phases. Nice. Not only that, but I inspired about 20 people. So they joined me in the group, like an accountability group. And... A lot of them are doing it for the first time. Oh, wow. I've done it three times successfully, and I failed twice. And this time I'm determined to make it a lifestyle so I don't go back to... Yeah. So the live hard. Yeah. Big things are going to happen for you. Mm, amen. <laughs> I'm expecting big things. I'm turning 40 on December 11th, and I want to really reach to that level in every area of my life that's going to be amazing what an amazing goal yeah what's one goal from the goals that you have if the other ones don't come to fruition but you can save this one what is the most important goal for you for 2024 that i absolutely have control over is that what you're saying <laughs> if you can i don't know how many goals you have i have mm -hmm. like almost 30 <laughs> but if you're go mentally through all the goals and let's say none of them take fruition but only one you can choose which one would it be that would be um cultivating a closer relationship with my son daughter things are going really well with my daughter and so i'm really happy about that going really well with my mother my you know other people in my life but my son that's the one that's awesome yeah well i pray for you and i believe that you will be successful thank you will be successful sons they can't help but to love their moms so figure out a way to spend more time with him and yeah that's the thing he's in his early 20s living with his girlfriend and so <laughs> he's off living his life but i would really like to cultivate that yeah vulnerability really helps so if you get him into a comfortable environment where he can just tell you what's going on yeah you would understand i'm excited for you Lori. thank I'm you for you and and the work that you're doing um what do you think is wrong with america and what's wrong with the world oh man i can't pick just america i think america um I think this really comes to people really knowing who they are again, that value, right? Really becoming clear with their values and their belief systems and being in integrity with that. It's one thing to talk about it. It's something else to live it. So really knowing like who you are and what you stand for. I think that's what's happening. Humanity, that's a whole nother um, thing. I, I think if people start to live a good life, and again, shift into integrity with their values and who they are. That will change as well. That will shift. But we we have it feels like overwhelming when you look at that at what's happening. But really, it all starts with ourselves. And if every single person started with themselves, it could shift really quickly. Tell me about your mission to help. Uh, human trafficking are you doing something besides one-on-one -on -one? are you a member of 
organization, you have a vision to help on a global scale. Did you see that movie, Sound of Freedom? I have not seen it yet. <laughs> Everyone asks me that. I haven't seen it yet. Um, and there's reasons behind that, but also, you know, it's, it, I hear I'm in, I've been in it. So I, to see a movie, um, I haven't had the time <laughs> to go and watch the movie. So with me, with the human trafficking, just give a quick backstory and context on that. Um, I fell into that actually without, without ever really knowing what human trafficking really was. My son's, um, one of his really good friends, childhood good friends, um, she was actually sold for drugs in Vegas. Vegas is not far from where we live. And so it's, it's easy to, to go there. And she was there with, and was sold for drugs. She was missing for about almost two months. Um, her mother did a video. The family did a video that actually ended up going viral. They were lucky enough to have friends that were professional filmers you know, or, and producers and all of that. And so they did this really amazing video that ended up going viral and while well, they were looking for her and um, she was able to be found because of that. Wow. Yeah, there was an organization that actually found her because what happens in these situations, especially when it's, um, it's a teen, you know, they think they've run away. <laughs> so there, you could do a missing persons report and all these things. And, and the, there's so much red tape and everything that goes along with this, that it's really hard to get law enforcement to really take it seriously. Yeah. And then things happen so fast, you know, it's like a time thing. So things happen so fast and girls and boys get moved so quickly. Um, Anyway, there's a lot of red tape that goes into it. There's an organization called CERT Ministries that actually goes out and does rescue. They got involved. And what's nice about having an organization that actually does rescues over law enforcement is that these organizations can actually go and do the work where the law enforcement, again, there has to be a crime committed. There has to be, you know, there's this whole process. And so this organization was actually able to go and get her, rescue her. And they actually had the LA FBI backing them up because they couldn't, you know, they couldn't be there. Things have to happen before they can get involved. They sold her for drugs, mm -hmm. like an exchange of drugs. Yeah. Yeah. She had some new friends that she went with. Wow. So dangerous. Yeah. So that was the whole thing. And whenever I, I learned more about it and I learned more about what goes on there and what she experienced and then this organization that went and what they do and, and how they, I mean, that is all they do. They just rescue almost every single day. And so I got to be really close with them and to really understand what it is that they do. Uh, and um, yeah, I just, I, I had to support them had to support them with mm -hmm. what they were doing because they really are boots on the ground going out and doing this work. So that landed me into how do I, and so I was doing that before I actually became a spiral practitioner. When I became a spiral practitioner and I realized how this is so advanced and it can really work quickly, like the healing journey happens quickly on this, of releasing conditioning around our past experiences, especially in a situation like that, then I had to really look at how do I, how can I really use this tool in this way with survivors? And it, it came back to, again, the root cause, like the root cause of domestic violence. There's actually a lot of children who they do leave and they do run away and or they're kicked out or, I mean, there's a lot of things there, but domestic violence is a common denominator there. So this is actually how I did end up now marrying what I do as a practitioner with trafficking, but it's the aftercare. Mm. So that's where it is. But um, yeah, I'm happy to share anything more on that or connect people to who they if the, you have a loved one, because it's not just children, you know, <laughs> it's, and it's not just sex trafficking, it's labor, it's everything else. So well, yeah, it's, I'm happy to connect people to resources with that too, if they, if they know anyone. What about you? What do you do with that? Um, well, 
I have a vision to build, this is down the road, on my 30th birthday, I was going through separation and with the mother of my child, of my daughter, and, and I was staying at my parents' house. And I was a very successful salesperson at that time, and I just felt like such a loser uh, because I wasn't a millionaire. I really wanted to be a millionaire before 30. And here I am at my parents' house. And I remember just crying to sleep. And it was a new experience for me because I have i didn't believe in boys cry before that point. But I was just so broken. And God came in my dream so vividly. So I saw my entire life uh, in like a movie. And I was still working. Um, at a company I was selling cars and God showed me the first the next 10 years from my life that I'm gonna build a platform for education for life skills sales skills marketing skills and really share my gift then the next 10 years are gonna be education through entertainment because people's attention spam is going out the window so you got to really catch the audience and make something engagement engaging uh, and the rest of my life from 50 on is building using all of the wealth I'm gonna gain through those two businesses and connecting with people that share the same values like yourself and building love centers in every city in the world and in those love centers um, I would offer education to parents so they could fight for their for their kids. So it's going to be a combination of power in prosecution, being able to recognize abuse. Mm -hmm. I think the system is broken in every country. There's just so much. Mm -hmm. So much of the sex trafficking starts because it's supported by the system. The people that are supposed to protect you are actually the ones getting bribes and, and helping behind the scenes for that. Yeah. And um, in those love centers, the children are going to be loved, supported, and developed and healed from the trauma. But their parents are going to have a chance to reunite if they um, follow the steps of the healing process. So it's not designed like DCFF or whatever the name is to just break families but it's actually investing time in education and nurturing those broken mm -hmm. broken people on both ends. I love that. And yeah, and then and, and my goal is so big. I want to help God eradicate child abuse and sex trafficking from the face of the planet. Probably 100 years are not going to be enough for this. So I'm mm -hmm. going to die before it's uh, it's done, but my uh, mission is to inspire so many other people to join me in this that eventually it will come to fruition one day. And uh, after I saw the movie, which is a very difficult movie to see as a father, and I'm sure as a as a and, and a woman would be very challenging. Uh, it's just like a roller coaster of emotions. There's so much anger and sadness. And um, after I saw the movie, God clearly spoke to me. And was like, you have, you're in the hub of these things. Like, city of Chicago is one of the most corrupt cities. Like, if you Google the most corrupt city in the world, it's probably mm -hmm. Chicago. <laughs> probably, but it is. And there's just so much of that going on right here in my backyard. So God really provoked me to, to do something about it. And I'm working hard on starting a nonprofit organization and. Because it's really hard to trust organizations that are working on, on that. They're actually the, the hub that sells the children. It's yeah. so nasty. Yeah, it's, it's so corrupt. Yeah, there's so many stories of foster parents. Mm -hmm. have 60 children in their basement. Yeah. And because they want to get more money from the government. And, and they're big time out of the problem. Not because of the abuse, but because they sell them to, to those. Mm -hmm. yeah. And 
there's just so much. So I feel like if I'm not in charge of this organization and, and handpicking people that have the extra chromosome of of loving and being compassionate, I would I wouldn't give my money to just any organization. I also support one um, group of folks there in Kentucky, I believe. They're called Rescue One, and they're just few dudes, uh, man's man, and a couple of ladies, and they are like rangers. They they get and they go and they save the child. They go, they risk, they go to Mexico, they go to California, they go to Vegas, and they're going there armed. They have a plan. They don't call the police. They just, <laughs> just they just go and do it, and then they. They have a shelter, they nourish the child, and then if the child wants to be released to the system or find the parents or whatever, they help with that. But they're kind of taking things in their own hands because the government have um, disappointed them so many times. As a matter of fact, for them to be able to do that, they had to get grants and get certified and get you know legalized. It was so difficult that we were like about 30 of us no 24 people we did a one hour live stream and we were um getting you know we were trying to raise money for them because the law is you gotta raise you gotta give four hundred thousand dollars of your own money and then the government will back you with 25 percent. so they'll give you another hundred but if you don't have 400 they won't give you anything and you, you need, and you can get certified. So basically you, you go there, you're like, Hey, we want to save kids. we got weapons. we got team. We're like you can't, it's illegal. Well, what do you mean? It's illegal. We want to do the right thing. If you want to get certified, you need to have 400 grand in liquid cash. And then we'll give you another hundred. And then it takes years to get the hundred grand. They don't just write you a check. It takes like, and they, they look you through, they, they they inspect everything. They try to they try to throw wrenches instead of helping. Yep. So that's those guys I trust and I believe and I've met with them and I know that they have really pure intentions and they're just heroes in my mind because they risk their own life every day and that's their mission. Mm -hmm. And there's there there are little militias like that in Texas that I know of. It's mostly down south and people that just hate pedophiles and they just take things in their own hands. Mm -hmm. I love that. I'm actually going to look them up. I wrote yeah, them down. Rescue one. Rescue one. Okay. Rescue one. Yeah. This is a lot the same. Um, and they need help. California. Certain ministries is over in California. And yeah. They actually have a good relationship with law enforcement there and work together and all that. But yeah, and rangers, all the things. <laughs> it's got to be the worst state because now that prostitution is legal, it's it's like it's probably the based on what these guys are telling me. Most cases are in California. It's like because yeah. it's they would run to California. Mm -hmm. The weather is nice; they can stay on the beach. It's like the Hollywood dream, and mm -hmm. a lot of kids would try to get there, and. Well, the other part of this, too, is that human trafficking is actually a business. So just like any other business, um, like any other trade, right, like a, a car oh. or construction or law office or anything like that, it, it is a business. And so, again, it's generational. It's a generational business that usually gets handed down. One of the things that I've found, so that's what certain ministries actually taught me where you know whenever i learned more about what they do and and met with them i've met with them quite a bit and they're just they're all about breaking the cycle of that too they're yes they're about the kids and rescuing the people and it's not just the children but all of them and that's including the the perpetrators the ones who are actually doing the trafficking because it is a business like that so they actually will help them as well if they want to get out of that business. And a lot of times they don't understand. So even whenever I, um, so I work with some people that, you know, with when I'm working with survivors, there are some survivors that will actually end up go out and traffic themselves 
after yeah. because that's the only way they know how to make money as well. So if they were raised in that, the trafficking thing's like a whole nother thing because they also provide their own product. So there's all these undocumented babies, children, people out there, you know? And so if they were raised in that and that's all they know and they get out of it and then they can't make it in the world, real world because that's fast cash, right? fast cash and they can get it quickly yeah. then they end up going back and doing that themselves and so it's it's beautiful whenever you can actually see the real cycle break in that one of the ways they they do it is through like beauty beauty contest modeling that's how they get beautiful kids and usually the the lady because um, who wouldn't trust a beautiful lady mm -hmm. the lady is a victim of of that yeah. And she's just developed such a thick skin that now she's the madame and she's reselling all these kids. And, and there's also, you know, hurt people, hurt people. There's also a way of revenge, a way of uh, like growing up bullies are bullied at their own home. That's why they want to bully somebody else. It's like a natural response. Mm -hmm. But you you hit it right on the nail it's business and it's not like selling cocaine or selling anything else because they can take one kid and sell that kid eight times a day and every day for 30 days and once when they shut down once when they're completely broken they just they don't fight you they just do what you tell them to do mm -hmm. and and they they break boys and girls and and a uh, little bit older girls. Mm -hmm. They retire them at like 18. So at 18, they have too many miles already. Mm -hmm. And they could either join the trafficking cycle and work with them or they kind of toss them on the street. And then they, the only thing they know is prostitution. So they, they try to do the same thing on their own or with another pimp. It's so sad. It's so sad. We okay. have different ways of doing it. But because of the clientele being such a high profile, and um, they protect them. You know, the good thing is that these Epstein records are coming out right now. So a lot of high profile people are mentioned there. Hopefully something happens with that. You know? I hope so. I really hope so. Because I've seen the direct effects of that. So it's we will see and also if it doesn't happen i hope the people stand up because it's it is scary when and you know you talk about chicago being one of one of the main hubs really like this is happening in every single community in every single small town it's the the people the kids are being moved so much, you know, like the, the bigger cities are the hubs where all this is happening, but this is literally happening in every, in every town. And I think that for me, that's what opened my eyes is I'd heard about human trafficking and I'd heard about all of this, but whenever it literally happened to somebody I knew yeah, and somebody that was close to me, that was a totally, and then for us to be lucky enough to have, you know, she was found and in a short amount of time, but I can't even, the damage that happened in that short amount of time that shows me what happens when they are in it for a lifetime. Yeah. Even more than a couple of years. I mean, it's, it's a very dark, dark um, industry and space to be. And honestly, most people can't handle what it is. So that's why they stick their head in the sand. And so I'm very, I want to say I'm proud of you for actually looking into it and wanting to do something about it because I think that it's hard for people to hear and then for people to actually say, no, I'm going to do something about this and I want to support the people that are doing something about this. That's huge. Yeah. Even a couple hours is too long being a victim. And before I really wanted to help homeless people and, um, and I've dealt with some homeless people depressed people that was my my mission but now in my experience most homeless people they have the same pattern of a victim mindset and they always blame somebody else for their situation and and complain of life and uh, have excuse for everything 
and I've, I've been let down by some homeless people that really took advantage of me and my compassion. So mm -hmm. I shifted my, especially after I became a parent, I shifted my focus on children because everything starts with children. Are so, I mean, I'm, I don't feel bad for 30 year old or 40 year old on the street who can get up and get a job. Like literally right now is the easiest time to get a job. I mean, I feel some sort of sympathy for them, but they need, they don't need money. They need inspiration, motivation. They need, they need. It's different. <laughs> yeah. Child is so innocent. They, they can't take care of themselves. They can't drive. They can't, they can't work. They can't do anything. And yeah. it's our responsibility to protect them. It's so evil to do this to children. So there is really a lot of passion and anger in, in me against, yeah. against pedophiles. And that's why I, I recommend you watch the movie as difficult as, as it is. Everyone needs to see it. There's just so much data shared. And um, hopefully one day we reunite in our mission, you and I, and we save millions of children together. That would be amazing. Teenagers. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, let me know how I can support you in this. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Lori, it's been such an amazing conversation. What are some words of uh, hope, words of wisdom you want to share with us to close this? Honestly, it just is. Maybe share, share with us because I never asked to search for interrupting. Um, I assume ADV stands for advanced. Mm -hmm. Spiral practitioner. What is a spiral practitioner? So it is emotional clearing, but it's very advanced. Um, it's several maps and models of emotional clearing, applied kinesiology, acupressure points. Um, if you're familiar with with um, NLP or any of the the collapsing or that. Dr. John Martin D. Martini talks about. I mean, it's all of those things. The power of now. It's all. It's it's so much combined into one that it gets to the root cause of the imprint of when a trauma has happened how, that you have experienced it. So rather than um, something like talk therapy, which is great because you can talk about it and it shows you your patterns and your cycles and brings things like that into your awareness or um, you know, other forms of healing modalities, this, this one actually goes straight to the point. <laughs> the mm -hmm. point of when it happened, the age that it happened, the situation that it happened, and we're able to release it from that point. And so whenever, I mean, we live our lives by reacting, that, that's just it. We live our lives by reacting and not responding. And we develop these reactions when we are, when we experience trauma. I mean, that's what happens right away. It's the coping mechanism. And so if something happened to you as a child, which usually it's between zero and seven years old, that, that different traumatic imprints happen, then that's actually what runs the show into your adulthood. So if, if let's say there was sexual childhood abuse that happened when you were at a young age, at three years old or something or five, it is that child that has developed whatever coping mechanism that may be, whether that's shutting down or dissociating or um, anger, whatever it may be, that child is actually what's running, running the show in your adult life. So mm -hmm. with spiral, we collapse all of that. We collapse all of it. You learn to respond from an authentic place versus react. We break neural pathways, create new ones. And that's why the transformation is so powerful and quick because it's about seven years worth of talk therapy done in a short amount of time. So it's interesting. There's, we don't know, we can't change anything until we know, right? Until it's brought into our awareness and you don't know what's happening when it's in your unconscious mind. So it's bringing things from the unconscious into your conscious awareness. And it's only from that space and from a space of neutrality that you can now start to respond differently, make different decisions and create this whole other life. And so that's what I do. I help people create a life that they love from an authentic place. And it's usually by the time we're done, it's 
in a place that they never, there's no reference point. So it, it's just one of those, it's really beautiful. And I absolutely love to share the work. I actually am starting to teach it. So <laughs> I'm teaching emotional clearing because it's been so valuable for me and those around me. So sounds like everyone needs it. Yeah. Well, Laurie, thank you so much for this amazing conversation. Last words of hope. How would you like to send off our viewers and listeners? Just be in your magic. Be in the now. We'll bring that back. Be in the now. Be in your magic. And just that's all you have to be is you. Even though it may feel super, super hard and difficult, that's all you have to do is be you. That's who the world wants to see. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Go to lauriekinsey.com, right? Yep. Yeah. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Can't wait to connect.